Okay. All right, so I think you did a great job uh, putting our presentations in order here, Frank, because I think we're continuing to build on the story of CXL and uh, great job by, by Michael talking about kind of some more of the benefits and some more of the, the practical, you know, here's a real device and I've got a few more to show. So um, I'm gonna talk about SMART a little bit. So um, SMART was founded in 1988. Um, I worked for SMART Modular Technologies. So we worked we work primarily on advanced um, memory products. So we are a memory company. Um, we have other sister companies at Penguin and Stratus who work more on a system level and then a Cree LED, which is kind of an industrial company. Um, we are all kind of under the umbrella of SMART Global Holdings. So it's SGH on the NASDAQ and you can see some of our financials and things there but we won't um, spend too much time on that. I'm gonna skip right over this. We've talked about this already before. We're talking about CXL memory expansion devices in, at this point. So I think these, this is reiterating some of the points that you, you may have heard, but I'll give my spin on it. So as we've heard already, one of the big advantages of CXL is that it can increase memory capacity quite easily. So you can imagine if you fully populate a, a server with um, memory dims, right? You will, will run out of space. And once you have populated all of those, there you have to start adding additional CPU sockets to, to increase the memory density, or you can start adding a CXL devices, right? And so that's kind of the key, key there. The added benefit or an added benefit is that you can also potentially reduce your overall memory costs. And I think um, there we've seen one or two examples of that. And I have some further um a further case study that we did in one of the upcoming slides, but the gist of it is that when you go to 3DS or TSV components, DRAM components, you pay a price premium for those. And as I'm sure you know, as many of you know, that's well deserved, right? They're they're more difficult to make, they're um, more difficult to test, and so obviously they're going to be a price premium involved with those. Um, so for maximum kind of value on, on building a system with maximum memory, if you can avoid getting to those high density components, you can really keep the memory cost down. So we'll get into a specific example of that. And then the other thing that I think we've touched on in several other presentations as well is that you can actually, even though CXL has a higher latency, um, primarily due to the addition of that controller, um, being in the interface between the CPU and the memory. It's not direct CPU to, to memory, it's CPU to controller to memory. So there is a little bit of added latency, but even with that, because you're adding another pathway to access memory, when the system or the cores are heavily loaded, they don't have to all line up to get access to that single, those, that, that handful of memory um, controllers that are in the CPU. They have another pathway to access memory. And I think, um, Michael did a great job of, of showing some examples of, of the performance increases that you can get there. Okay, so we've talked about this a little bit before too. What's driving the, the need for all the DRAM? Obviously, AI is the big, big one that everybody's talking about. But there's some other real applications that um, are driving it as well. One of them is just kind of purely the in-memory databases, the SAP HANA and the SQL models that are out there. So, so that's an important one. And also video processing. So we're seeing applications such as uh, security cameras in stores. You know, you get those self-checkout kiosks. And uh, <laughs> apparently people have been taking uh, low price stickers and putting them on high price items and then scanning them in the self-checkout. And so they wanna do real time um, analytics of security camera processing so that they can say, nope, that, that item you just scanned does not match <laughs> what you just put in your shopping bag. So. Applications like that um, require video processing, requires a lot of memory. And even in biotech, we're seeing uh, DNA sequencing machines. They actually generate tremendous amounts of data and it's gotta be stored and processed. And it's far faster to do that if you can do it all in memory, right? So a lot of different applications here that are, that are driving forward. It's not just AI, I guess is the point here, but AI is obviously a very important one. Okay. So we see the adoption of CXL kind of coming in two phases. And I think um, the first phase is that direct attached memory, and that's gonna be in a couple of different form factors, which we touched on this morning, but that is gonna be implemented first. And then following on, we'll have that disaggregation of CXL memory, which will be, um, which, which we talked about as well. But one thing I do wanna mention is um, even once that disaggregation of CXL memory behind switches or in, in memory sharing, uh, becomes a reality, we don't see the in-system CXL devices going away. 
we see them working in parallel. Um, and I think that once those are adopted and once they're available in systems, you still get a lot of performance benefits from having CXL memory in the system, as well as, as having an external um, pool available as well. So we see them coexisting. So this is this is a different take on the when is it coming, right? So we keep talking about it for for a long time, but uh, when is it going to get here? And so uh, we heard of CMAC went over the the CXL 3.1 um, spec and the differences there. That was released late last year. So the spec is here. They're continuing to make improvements, or we're continuing to make improvements to add additional features and clarifications. So that'll be an ongoing process. But the bottom line is, from a specification point of view, we've got it. When you look at the controller manufacturers, there's a number of different companies that are making CXL controllers that you can use to build these devices. And uh, the majority of them are supporting the CXL 2.0 spec features at this point. Many of them will be transitioning to 3.0 towards the end of this year or into 2025. So that's where we are on the devices. And then here you can see the CPUs are kind of they have a very long development cycle, obviously. So uh, it takes them time to get those features integrated into the CPUs. But as we learned earlier, they're all backwards compatible, right? So you can have a, a device that, that's a 2.0 and it will work on a 1.1 capable system. You just don't necessarily have access to all the features, but it will still work for a memory expansion device, right? So I talked before about the two, um, the two the two types of adoption that we're seeing the direct attach in a server as well as that that memory pooling adoption and we do see two ramps occurring in the in the industry and the first ramp is starting this year uh, those direct attached devices as, as micron just showed is are available now and we see them being integrated into systems and going into production uh, this year i have a number of devices that we'll we'll talk about as well that are also going to be available this year and then we do see kind of that second tier, that second ramp kicking off once the 3.0 spec becomes widely available next year. And then that will ramp as well. But I do want to reiterate, those will coexist. The, the direct attach and the memory pooling, we really see happening kind of side by side and, and working together in the ecosystem. Okay, so this is a lineup of products that, uh, CXL products that Smart's going to be introducing in 2024. The top row is um, a family of add-in cards that we've been developing for, for quite some time. The first one is an 8 dim add-in card. Um, and then we have a 4 dim add-in card. And then we're also looking at some different configurations of, of a 4 dim, potentially a low profile one, as I'm showing here. Um, that's still in feasibility and design. Uh, and then on the bottom row, you see our E3 form factors. So these are um, lower capacity than the ones that, that Micron showed. We have a 64 gigabyte that was largely done as a proof of concept um, device, which has been extremely helpful for us and for our partners to get CXL up and running in real systems. Um, and uh, the different one, another difference is this is a by 16 device. So um, our E3s support 16 lanes, um, and that is good for performance but not all servers support that in the front bay yet so um, just a, a trade-off there that you're doing and we are going to be introducing a 96 gigabyte version of that device uh, a little bit later this year so the last one in the corner here um some of you may be familiar with nv dims um obviously optane was was a big uh persistent memory device that came out um and has since reached end of life but uh, in, in addition to that, there's uh, NVDIM ends, which have been around for quite a while. They're essentially DRAM with NAND flash on the device. Um, and then they use supercapacitors to, to do a backup to the NAND flash in the event of a power loss. Well, those have been somewhat niche, but also pretty successful in the DDR4 ecosystem. Well, that support for those devices is not planned to be carried forward to DDR5. Instead, what we're looking at doing is non-volatile um, CXL devices. So I'll, I'll talk about a little more detail of that coming up. Okay, so the first one is um, we have an 8DIM add-in card. So this is in that um, add-in card or chem form factor that I talked about earlier this morning. It's a full height, half length, dual width um, card. And it's going to be using or does use two CXL controllers. That's so that we can get the capacity of the four of the eight DIMs. Right, each controller has two memory um, channels, and each channel can support up to two DIMMs per channel. That's where we get up to the eight um, devices. It does exceed that 75 watt limit that I was talking about this morning, 
about uh, regarding what power can be provided from the edge connector. So you'll notice there is an auxiliary power connector here to get us a, a little bit more power that's necessary to power this device. But one of these cards can support up to you know, a terabyte of memory, depending on uh, the capacity that, of modules that you install. The next one, this is our uh, Ford in add-in card. This is uh, going to be sampling. I should mention the, the ATIM is going to be sampling this quarter, right? So engineering samples will be available this quarter. This one is sampling next quarter. This is a four DIM add-in card. It's a little bit difficult to see. You see one DIM sticking up and one DIM kind of pointing down towards the connectors, but there's actually a pair of DIMs there and a pair of DIMs on the uh, top as well. This fits in that single width. Um, it's a full height, half length, but a single width card. And it's using a single by 16 controller. Right with two 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 memory channels. This one uh, again is going to be available for your engineering samples coming up uh, next quarter. So we're we're really excited about that one. We also have in development a different uh, four DIM option. This is more for a low profile system. Some some servers require kind of this low profile option, like a two U server. This is kind of a nice form factor for that. So this one is in a development for later this year. And we've seen a couple of studies on the cost advantage, but let me let me walk you through kind of the analysis that we've done for one kind of example. So this is an example where you want to build a, a system where where one CPU has a total of one terabyte of memory, right? In today's ecosystem without CXL, you would need to populate if it's if it's capable of supporting eight DIMMs, which is a, a fairly common um, scenario with with a CPU for DDR5. You would need to populate it with eight. 128 gigabyte modules, right, in order to, to meet that one terabyte system. Today, um, when you make the leap to 128 gigabyte modules, you are going to those 3DS devices. So there is a price per gigabit premium that you pay for those and, and well-deserved. It's, it's, as I mentioned, it's a, a difficult device to, to build, but um, there is that, that little bit of a cost overhead. And so your total cost would be a little over almost $13,000 just for the memory in that device. If instead you have a system that's capable of supporting CXL, you could add a single eight DIM add-in card, for example, and use a total of 16 64 gigabyte modules, avoid that, pre that, that premium, and you can pay a total of 60% um, less for your memory cost. That's including cost of like the add-in card itself, right? So now you do, you do end up with with kind of the two, two memory tiers, if you will, the direct attached memory and the CXL attached memory. So it would be very useful to take advantage of some of those tiering solutions that had been talked about in some of the earlier presentations. But um, for pure cost analysis, it, it has some significant advantages. Okay, this is our um, E3 form factor module. This is um, the 64 gigabyte version. We are gonna be releasing a, a 96 gigabyte version coming up. Um, this is a by 16 interface using a single CXL controller and two DRAM channels behind it. You kind of get a pretty good idea of what it looks like there. And then I want to spend a little bit of time on this one. So this is our non-volatile device. This is going to be released for engineering samples kind of later this year, late this year. And what we're doing here is we have um, a CXL controller in this device. And so you're, the host system can talk through CXL and access the DRAM directly um, via that interface. So it's full speed. There's there's no NAND access from the host point of view. It's just full, full DRAM device. But then in, in the event of a power failure, what happens is the device takes over and it takes control of that DRAM and copies the data to NAND flash using onboard supercapacitors, right? So there'll be this will be all self-contained unit and it will use those super capacitors to copy all the data into NAND flash. And then when the system comes back up, it will copy all of the data back into DRAM and therefore the system sees its data present. And so um, <clears throat> this is a pretty exciting um, device that we're, we're looking forward to introducing later this year. We're working with a number of ecosystem partners to, to make sure that this functions well in systems and requires minimum um, interaction from the, the host or the user. The, the goal is to plug it in and have, have it work, right? Okay, so this is uh, some of the reasons why SMART has kind of fallen right into the CXL lap and we, 
we're we're well suited to to making these devices. You can see we have quite an extensive portfolio of CXL devices coming out already this year, um, and that's because it just it fits right in the sweet spot of what we do. We do specialty memory. We do memory with controllers. We've done NV DIMMs in the past. We do um, serial attached memory. We've worked on memory with all of these standards previously. Um, and we have a very experienced team that we've been working with for, for 30 plus years to, to do these types of devices. So CXL is, is really exciting for us um, because it, like I said, it falls right into the scope of what we do. And that's it. So if you would like information about any of these products, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. The, the, the link will bring you to our, our website, but you can also reach out to me directly.